Hello, my name is Edgar Peterson. I'm the director of the African Center for Cities at the University of Cape Town. In this lecture today, I want to explore with you whether we can transcend this condition that we call slum urbanism in the context of Africa. In the lecture, I will try and explore three different aspects of this problematic. In the first instance, I will try to unpack what do I mean by the idea of slum urbanism? What are some of the trends that suggest to us that we are dealing with a condition that I insist we name slum urbanism? I want to then use this as a setup to explore whether this fate, whether this condition is inevitable in the context of Africa, or whether it's possible to explore alternatives, whether it is possible to think beyond the probability of slum urbanism. And then I will conclude the lecture by reflecting on what the institutional implications might be. So let's begin by locating Africa's urbanization within a global context. The first set of issues that I want to discuss with you is the fact that we talk about two waves of urbanization in the world. The first wave happened between 1750 and 1950 in what we call the global north. This is when countries in that part of the world went from around 10% urban to the tipping point, which is 50% urban. In practical terms, this represented a growth from 15 million people living in urban areas to 423 million living in urban areas by 1950. Now keep that picture in mind and let's go and explore what has happened in the rest of the world. Now interestingly enough, when the global north reached its tipping point of 50% urban, what we found was that in the global south, the urbanization transition started to take off. So in 1950, 18% of the total population in the global south was urban. This represented around 300 million people. And what we are anticipating is that that number will increase by tenfold by 2030. In other words, we are reflecting here, we are seeing the massive explosion of the urban population, not in 200 years, but rather in 80 years. Furthermore, the scale of this transition is completely unprecedented. It is completely different to the transition from 10 million to 420 million. So not only do governments in the global south have to contend with this massive urbanization challenge, they also confront it with a number of other related challenges. One, they've got to, of course, make sure that the basic needs of all of these people are met. Secondly, they've also got to deal with the economic fundamentals of this large population group. And finally, they've got to oversee the transition of the economies from what we call a carbon intensive economy or dirty economy to a low carbon economy. And all of this needs to be done in the period of just 40 years, because this is when we will see Africa and the rest of the global south re reaching its urban tipping point. Now, let's consider this context from a slightly different angle. We, of course, know that the global population is anticipated to go to around 9 billion by, by 1950, and that's off a base of 6 billion at the moment, or 6.5 billion. But within this, the urban population is expected to more than double. And within the urban population, we're also anticipating two important phenomena. One, we're expecting middle classes to more than double, and we're also expecting the slum populations to treble over the next 40-year period. And this represents a very interesting and important set of pressures or challenges that will have to be dealt with if Africa and the rest of the global south cities are going to be dealt with or managed more sustainably. Now let's hone in on the case of Africa specifically. In the context of Africa, we're seeing that it is, if you will, manifesting its urban transition over a 60 to 100 year period. So this graph illustrates the change in population, both in terms of the absolute growth in population, but also the changes in rural and urban populations between 1950 and 2050. And if you look closely, you will notice that at the moment, we are still not at 40% urban. We are around 420 million urbanites across Africa. But this number will shift to just over 50% around the mid-2030s. And by 2050, we anticipate that 62% of Africa's total population will be urban. The majority of, uh, of African urban dwellers, of course, live in slums, 62%, as we've seen. But what is important is that this is higher than any of the other two important world regions, Latin America and the Caribbean, or Southeast Asia. 
Now, what is significant, of course, is that Southern Asia incorporates populous countries like India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and so forth. And still, in sub-Saharan Africa, 62% of the urban population live in urban areas. But more importantly, a large proportion of that group experience extreme deprivation or extreme deficiencies in terms of living conditions. Now, if we then consider that not only are people living informally, but they're also working informally, or they're working in what we call vulnerable jobs, we begin to understand the scale and the magnitude of the challenge. So let's look at the demographic transition that Africa will go through. At the moment, more than 50% of the African population are 19 years and younger. We're anticipating that over the next 40 years, the labor force will grow from 400 million to 1.2 billion. Now let's think of that. If the majority of those people are currently in vulnerable unemployment, and McKinsey Global Institute tells us that it's 63%, we can anticipate that a substantial proportion of that growth will also be in vulnerable unemployment. Let's unpack those numbers a little bit more closely. This is data from 2000. And it differentiates between three categories of employment, vulnerable, unemployed, and stable employment. Now, as you can see, 65% of the labor force in 2000 was captured in vulnerable employment. In other words, they're working informally or they're working in a family business. But you may think, well, hasn't Africa grown dramatically over the last decade? If we, in, and this is in fact true, if you look at the GDP growth rate since 2000, Africa is amongst the highest growth rates outside of China in the world. And yet, if we then consider the data for 2010, we will see that this has hardly made any impact in the proportion of the labor force that's in vulnerable employment. This condition generates slum urbanism logics. What is this logic? Essentially, it starts off with a premise that we've got a majority informal economy, inverted if you will, this in turn produces low and erratic household incomes. This means that municipalities or governments have very, very small tax bases to draw on. And as a result, you have a shortage of private and public investments for important urban infrastructure and services. But this is not the end of it. It is not just a question of scarcity. The further problem is that the process of allocating that limited resource is in fact skewed. This is skewed because of dysfunctional politics and because of rent-seeking behavior. What this then results in is that you have a situation where demand always outstrips supply. A consequence, you've got more of an inverted economy, you've got more informal economic life and informal living, in a word, slum urbanism. Now, the background information to this is important to understand. So a few points to recognize what the realities are that we have to deal with on the ground in most African cities. Firstly, across the continent, you've got a situation of long-term under and malinvestment in crucial urban infrastructure. Secondly, this has generated a situation of what we call infrastructure backlogs. The consequence of this is that there's been a tendency in recent years, as growth has picked up, for governments to accept any form of investment that they can get. And there are a number of private developers out there who are too happy to bring what, what they term turnkey projects or turnkey solutions to these governments. The problem with these investments are that they tend to produce all the things we don't want. Gated communities, more and more shopping malls, highways that lead to nowhere, and most importantly, often vanity projects that tend to only service the egos of politicians or these companies themselves. The net effect of all of this is that you see across Africa a terrible situation emerging. Dramatic sprawl, ecological degradation, increasing spatial and social divides, and most importantly, underinvestment in slum areas. And then we wonder why it is that we can't get a handle on this particular challenge. Now, in the world of academic literature and in the world of policymaking, we call this phenomena, this condition, splintered urbanism. What you have in Africa, though, is extreme splintered urbanism. The condition where slum neglect at a large scale is combined with enclave elite urbanism. Look at these two images. The bottom is an anticipation by a private developer about how Kinshasa should be transformed over the next 20 years. It reflects the quintessential expression 
of gated enclave, enclave urbanism. The other image reflects a slum dweller in the same city. Now, the truth about this is that the more the government prefers the glitzy alternative, the less money there will be to deal with the slum condition in the same city. Now, if we keep this in mind, it's important to understand that this is a systemic phenomenon. Splintered urbanism is a concept that captures the interrelated dynamics between the privatization of key public services, the fragmentation of urban geographies between those who have access, usually a minority, and those who don't, and the inevitable production of underserviced areas that we, of course, call slums. Now, if these trends continue into the future, if the current conditions more or less remain the same over the next 20 years, what we can anticipate is the agglomeration of a number of negative trends or pressures, or what I like to call as the urban poly crisis. This is a phenomenon where you see water scarcity being reinforced by energy scarcity, which in turn tends to produce pressure on the availability of food and the quality of food, and of course, the scarcity of land. Now, this is, if you will, in the biophysical context. If you look at the economic context, you will also see continued underemployment and unemployment, and you will see the degradation of ecosystem services. Now, what we, of course, know is that in the last period, young people are no, no longer willing to accept this. And so we've seen more and more protests. We've seen more and more expression of what we can call democratic voice. Now, these various phenomena reinforce each other, and they generate, over time, a cumulative dynamic, which, in effect, will represent a very, very challenging urban crisis. So as we've seen that most African cities manifest a systemic condition of various forms of crisis that intersect. Now, is it possible to think beyond this? Is it possible to transcend this condition of slum urbanism? At the African Center for Cities, we've been exploring the idea of operating systems. If we think of a city, any city in the world, whether it's in Africa or in any region, as essentially comprising of four operating systems, infrastructure, economy, spatial form, and of course governance, then it begins to help us to think through alternatives. Let me illustrate. If we consider the same diagram, but now we've inserted certain normative aspirations, for example, sustainable infrastructure, an inclusive economy, a just spatial form, and democratic governance, it helps us to identify how to begin to systemically transform these operating systems. Let's explore each of these in turn. Sustainable infrastructure has two dimensions. On the one hand, we're looking at the neighborhood scale at what we call local social infrastructure. These involve essentially social development investments like health, education, and so forth. But it also includes key public infrastructures like public space, access to recreation, and cultural facilities. On the other hand, if we think, look at the city as a regional system, we also know that there are important regional biophysical infrastructures that ensure we get access to energy, water, our waste is dealt with, we can resolve sanitation, deal with mobility, and so forth. Now, these operate at different scales. One is micro, one is macro. Both are equally important, and both are constitutive of sustainable infrastructure. We now turn to inclusive economies. This involves on the one hand, the establishment or the growth of competitiveness within the mainstream or the formal economy, but with a crucial proviso. It also involves an inclusive dimension with informal economies, the livelihood practice of the poor, social economies, which references the reciprocity within poor communities in particular, systems of solidarity and so forth. But it also involves an understanding of what we call the space economy, which in turn leads us to bring everything back together to the idea of the green economy. The final aspect of this alternative, then, is how do we achieve a just spatial form? And here, a number of themes open up. Most importantly, thinking about land markets and how we can make land markets more inclusive, but also how we can think differently about land use so that we can see more compact urban forms emerging, mixed uses, and most importantly, a much more integrative and public-oriented spatial form. These, of course, are not answers to all of Africa's problems, but what it does do, it helps us to focus the mind to understand that we need to transition all cities from a situation where very few people have access to basic services, and in the case of sub-Saharan Africa, fortunately, most economies 
are still relatively efficient. In other words, they've got very low carbon profiles. But we need to transition them to a situation where they can move from low services and low carbon intensity to high levels of service access, but also low carbon intensity in the future so that it can remain competitive within a low carbon global economic system. Now, at, this also helps us to understand then that at the neighborhood level, we can rethink the nature of public investments around basic services first, universal access to your basic rights, for example, shelter, health, and so on. But then crucially, not housing, but rather public infrastructure and a focus on mobility, then ecosystem services, and lastly only, investment into shelter. Of course, these are not mutually exclusive, but it's important to understand that you've got to get the hierarchy right. And all of these can be done in a way that compensates for the low tax base by involving the labor and the social organizations and social power of the poor themselves. Finally then, we can bring all of this together to an institutional imaginary about how we can govern African cities differently. This requires fundamentally the production of a growth management strategy that helps us to plot that transition to the future where we have low carbon and also universal access to basic services, but in a way then that sets the agenda for what we want to do with infrastructure, where our economy should be going, and how all of that manifests within the spatial development framework of our cities. All of that in turn then of course translates into land use management systems, which in turn has to be evidence-based. And by evidence, I'm not simply referring to cadastral maps, I'm also referring to the intelligence and to the enumeration of the poor themselves. And only when we bring all of this data together can we really truly build the institutions that is necessary to build cities that fundamentally and truly transcend the condition of slum urbanism. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure to offer this lecture to you.